The French Empire was one of the most powerful in human history. At its height, it controlled almost 10% of the world's land area. From Southeast Asia to West Africa, the country we today associate with baguettes and cinema was a dominant global power. And that was particularly true in Africa. France oversaw territory spanning 17 modern-day nations, from Morocco to the Congo. Under the banner of a civilizing mission, France oversaw brutal occupations that engorged the wealth of the empire and left a terrible legacy for ordinary Africans, marked by slavery, extraction, and murder. And today, France's empire in Africa is still around, in a streamlined, more profitable, and even more exploitative form. Let me explain. In the aftermath of the Second World War, there was a wave of decolonial movements sweeping across Africa and Asia. And the French, humiliated by their defeat and occupation at the hands of the Nazis, were eager to maintain their empire. So they responded to revolts in Algeria, Indochina, and Madagascar with brutal reprisals. Maintaining foreign holdings became increasingly difficult. By 1960, France was forced to grant independence to almost all its colonies. But something really important happened in Africa. Basically, the leadership of France decided to keep their empire in Western and Central Africa intact in everything but name. The plan was simple. When an African country gained its independence, it was made to sign a so-called cooperation agreement with France, which would outline the nature of their relations moving forward. In exchange for French foreign aid, African countries were required to give France rights over natural resources, allow France to maintain troops in their territory indefinitely, and, most importantly, keep these countries' currencies linked to France's currency, the franc. Instead of having their own currency, they were to use the franc of the financial community of Africa, what is now called the CFA franc. The French framed these cooperation agreements as a choice, but they were also clear about the consequences of defiance. When the leader of Guinea, a socialist named Sekou Touré, rejected the cooperation agreement with France and declared that he preferred to be poor in freedom than rich in slavery, the French government decided to make an example of him. They cut all foreign aid to Guinea and did everything they could to destabilize the government. They launched a secret campaign to print fake Guinean banknotes and flood the country with them. One French spy later bragged, the operation was a total success. Guinea's economy, already very weak, never fully recovered. The French said that these countries existed within the so-called French community, but the policy would come to be known more widely as France Afrique. It was about having the former colonies in a position that was maximally advantageous to French interests. Many of the first generation of post-colonial leaders in former French colonies had essentially been installed by the French. They spoke French, had spent time in France, and were well integrated with French elites. Jacques Foucault, a French diplomat, oversaw French relations with Africa for almost 30 years and built a huge web of client relationships with African leaders, using corruption and covert operations to make them loyal subordinates. When local political orders were threatened, the French weren't afraid to protect their hand-picked dictators. Since 1960, France has invaded Africa more than 50 times. Look at the Central African country of Gabon as one example. Gabon is particularly important to France because it has a huge supply of oil and an even bigger supply of uranium. Among the African colonies, Gabon was historically one of the very closest to France. In 1967, a man named Omar Bongo became Gabon's president, soon turning the country into a one-party dictatorship. And Bongo was intimate with France. He had been appointed after flying to Paris for what was basically a job interview with the president. So under Bongo, France and Gabon enjoyed a relationship that benefited both sets of elites. Gabon's oil was pumped by the French state-owned oil company ELF, and its uranium went right into France's arsenal of nuclear weapons. In return, France subsidized Gabon's budget, especially the parts that flowed into the pockets of Omar Bongo and his family. At one point, Bongo was worth over $130 million. Gabon, meanwhile, remained poor and underdeveloped. Under Bongo, it had one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. Instead of investing in the Gabonese economy, Bongo spent state funds on influencing French politics in his favor, bankrolling the campaigns of central future French presidents. Even today, France keeps troops in the country to support Gabon's current ruler, who happens to be Omar Bongo's son. And somehow, Gabon is actually one of the happier stories. Other countries, like the Central African Republic, are today some of the poorest in the world, in part due to the legacies of French-backed dictators like Jean-Bédel Bocassa. But there's another aspect of French influence that's even more important. 
probably the most central part of all is a CFA franc, the last colonial currency still in widespread use. In practice, the countries that use a CFA franc have virtually no monetary sovereignty. The value of their currency is linked to the euro. The poorest countries in the world have a currency controlled by the richest countries. And so the imperatives of European countries, fiscal discipline and fighting inflation, end up shaping the very different world of Western and Central Africa. That leads to an overly tight approach to credit, something that's necessary in our current system for an economy to grow. It means that any appreciation in the euro makes exports from these countries less price competitive. So just look at what happened in Senegal. When the euro appreciated against the dollar from 2000 to 2009, the value of the CFA franc got higher. But this made local Senegalese rice more expensive than imported rice from Thailand. So Senegal, which was trying to build its own domestic rice industry, instead saw Thai rice wipe out local rice farmers. So because domestic products are expensive, this makes export-driven growth nearly impossible, which is necessary to lead a country out of poverty. That's why most countries that use a CFA franc have growth rates significantly lower than their neighbors. Because the CFA discourages the development of domestic industry, many of these economies have actually been shrinking. The Ivory Coast, the largest CFA franc country, has a real GDP per capita one-third lower than it had in 1978. Other CFA franc countries like Cameroon and the Republic of the Congo reached their highest levels of real GDP per capita in the 70s and 80s. And because economic growth is weaker, there's more incentive for local elites in these countries, always tied closely to French multinationals, to take as much money out as possible. Billions of dollars have flooded out of these countries and into shell corporations and foreign bank accounts. Through massive corruption, these African elites have joined the ranks of the global super rich. In 2007, for example, Omar Bongo's daughter-in-law appeared on VH1 to buy an LA mansion for $25 million. And elites in France get a great deal too. They enjoy cheap access to natural resources and kickbacks from shady business deals. A French billionaire named Vincent Bolloré now owns most of the major ports across West Africa. In France, Bolloré is known as the quote, king of Africa. So French colonialism in Africa has never really ended. This is why academics use the term neo-colonialism. Even as the branding of empire has faded away, the structures of economic extraction have only grown stronger. This neo-colonialism is actually a much more efficient form of exploitation than the colonialism of the past. The French no longer pretend to care about building functional governments or improving local living standards. It's pure extraction, all the time. So these African countries are not underdeveloped, they're over-exploited. France is almost totally reliant on its influence in Africa for its economic power. In the words of Italy's foreign minister, if France didn't have its African colonies, because that's what they should be called, it would be the 15th largest world economy. Instead, it's among the first, exactly because of what it's doing in Africa. And the French know this. Francois Mitterrand, former president of France, said it himself. Without Africa, he declared, France will have no history in the 21st century. Today, of course, France faces competition from China within Africa and new challenges to the colonial symbolism of the CFA franc. There are plans to change the currency's name and abandon the most overt symbols of the colonial past to make it look like the system is more African than French. But France has no intention of actually abandoning a system of extraction that has made it one of the richest nations on earth. The real question is whether the next generation of Africans will allow it to continue. I'm Ismail Lutfi for the Gravel Institute.